All right, so hello and welcome everyone to the sixth lecture in the Consciousness and Reality Colloquium series, which seeks to inspire interdisciplinary investigations on topics such as the mind, cognition, consciousness, and nature of reality. Uh, I'm Kunal Mule, a research scientist in the Division of Physics, Math, and Astronomy at Caltech, and also the co-founder of IMIX, which is the Institute for Mind, Intelligence, and Consciousness Studies. So today we have a special guest, uh, Bernardo Castrop, the executive director of the Essentia Foundation, who has a double PhD, one uh, in philosophy and another in computer engineering, where his contributions span ontology, the philosophy of mind, reconfigurable computing, and artificial intelligence. As a scientist, Bernardo has worked uh, for the European Organization for Nuclear Research, which is the CERN, and also the Philips Research Laboratories, where the Casimir effect, if some of you physicists may recall, the Casimir effect of quantum field theory was discovered. And as a philosopher, Bernardo has authored several books, academic papers, essays, and blogs, and his work has revived interest in metaphysical idealism, which is the notion that reality is essentially a mental one. So Bernardo, I'd request you to please take it away with a note to all the participants to please submit your questions through the Zoom Q&A box, please. All right, you know, thanks for the, for the introduction and the kind words. Um, I will share my screen with you. Um, it's easier. Let me see, can, can you guys uh, see my title slide? Absolutely. All right. So we talk about analytic idealism um, today, but first let me briefly uh, inter introduce myself to you. Um, I have a lot of affinity with the part of the world um, you are in. I worked um, in computer engineering for quite a while and then semiconductors manufacturing, working for ASML for 15 years. Um, today, I only do these little things you see on the screen, uh, retro style uh, open source computers. So I still have a sort of a, a foot on the side of, of computer engineering, um, but now as a hobby. Um, and the reason I'm mentioning this to you is twofold. One is uh, to highlight to you that um, I am one of you. <laughs> I have been a techie for, for a quarter of a century. Um, and two, it's because um, in computers lies the origin of my interest um, in the philosophy of mind. I worked at CERN, and after that, I did work on AI. And you always ask yourself the question, if I can develop some, a computer that is intelligent, um, what does it take to make it conscious as well? And, um, of course, that question has no, no answer because it arises from... Um, an eternal contradiction in our way of thinking, but asking the question is what forced me to review my assumptions, take a few steps back, and uh, and come up with a different worldview, first for myself, and then at some point I started publishing it. Now the background of everything I will be telling you today, and I want to keep, I want you to keep this in mind. Um, at some point in the early 19th century, we've made. A, a, a major transition from thinking about the world in terms of things to thinking about the world in terms of fields and field excitations that began with uh, James Maxwell and his electromagnetic field, which was extended uh, initially by Feynman and then others um, to, to everything, not only electromagnet electromagnetism, but everything. And that's quantum field theory in which things are just uh, quantum fluctuations of underlying fields. In other words, there are no things. There are only excitations of underlying quantum fields. So keep this in mind, this para paradigmatic transition from thinking about reality in terms of things to thinking about reality in terms of extended fields. Now, uh, before we even begin, let's acknowledge um, um, a few obvious uh, things. Um, all we have is perception. Uh, that's, that's our interface to reality out there. We can only perceive reality. We, don't, we do not have direct access to it. Um, nonetheless, and even though perception is, of course, mental, there obviously is something outside our individual minds and which is not dependent on our individual thoughts. 
Um, otherwise, I would be able to change the world by doing mental affirmations in the morning. <laughs> that has never worked. Um, so clearly, there is something out there. If you were sitting next to me in my study right now, you would describe my, my study in a way consistent with my own experience of it. So we both uh, inhabit, we all inhabit a context, a reality beyond our individual mind. Uh, but physics describes only our apprehension of that reality, the way that reality presents itself to us on the screen of perception. If you want to do physics in a completely metaphysic, metaphysically agnostic manner, in other words, in a purely scientific manner, um, then you have to take the approach of a physicist, uh, Marcus Miller, from the Institute of Quantum Optic, Optics uh, and Quantum Information in Vienna, uh, he says that the business of physics is to answer the question, what will I see next? Even if what I will see next is the pattern of clicking in instrumentation. We are always restricted to perception, even if we use instrumentation, because we have to perceive the output of instrumentation as well. Now, to think that the world out there, even though clearly beyond and, and distinct from our individual minds, to think that it is necessarily non-mental, uh, is a gratuitous uh, uh, metaphysical assumption that doesn't have clear motivation. Um, my thoughts are mental, but they are external to you. If you were not there right now, I would still be having my thoughts. And you may do your affirmations every morning, and my thoughts are still whatever they are. They will not change because of your affirmations or your fantasies of or your wishes, your, 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 your phobias or whatever. So there can be mental stuff outside your individual mind. There can be mental stuff that is external to you as an individual mind. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that this stuff outside is non-mental. That You see, we acknowledge ex the external world, but we don't need to rush and associate with that uh, the, the property of being non-mental. That, that, to make that extra step requires justification. And I will argue against uh, that uh, justification. Now, let's begin from, from the start. If you are sitting on an airplane and you look out the window and you see the clouds and you see the sun, the horizon, storm, lightning, and all that, is what you see the world as it is in itself? In other words, do we have direct access to the world as it is? Is perception a transparent window into the world? And there are good reasons, even definitive reasons, to conclude that it, it is not. It cannot be. Now, you don't need to go through any of these equations here. I'm just illustrating to you one of the papers. But the point here um, is the following. If we were to perceive inside our minds the world as it is, that means that the external states of the world would have to be mirrored in our internal states, our internal cognitive states would have to mirror the states of the world. But there is no upper bound to the dispersion of the states of the world. There is no limit to its entropy, no a priori limit. We cannot arbitrarily proclaim that it does have a, a, an upper bound. For all we know, for all we know it, it doesn't. So if we were to mirror the states of the world in our internal cognitive states, there would be no uh, uh, upper bound to the entropy or the dispersion of our internal states. In other words, to look at the world could lead to your melting into hot meat soup. Um, but we never saw anybody melting just by looking at the world. So therefore, we don't really mirror the states of the world. We represent the states of the world internally in an encoded form that limits our internal entropy. That's the message here. Another argument that goes to the same place is based on game theory. Um, evolution is about fitness, not about presenting the world to us as it, as it is. To give you an example, imagine if you could see the files in your computer as the files really are on your desktop. Well, you would then be exposed to millions of open or closed microscopic switches, and you wouldn't begin to be able to operate your computer. You would be overloaded with irrelevant information, and your perception wouldn't sort of pick out what is salient uh, about your files, so you could work with them. So instead of that, 
Windows and Mac OS and Linux, they present the files to us in an encoded form, in the, in the form of little rectangles on our computer desktop. Evolution is the same thing. We would not have evolved to see gazillions of open and closed microscopic switches. We would not have evolved to see the world as it is. We would have evolved, and we did evolve, to pick out in an encoded form what is salient about reality around us, what is salient about the states of the world. So we have higher fitness, a higher chance to survive uh, and reproduce. So we don't really see the world as it is. Um, what appears on the screen of perception is a dashboard representation of the world, uh, like the dials on an airplane's dashboard. An airplane has sensors that measure the states of the world. So do we, we have retinas, we have eardrums, we have the surface of the skin, the lining of the nose, uh, the tongue papilla. Um, so we have these sensors that measure the states of the world. So does the airplane. Now, how does the airplane then present or represent the results of those measurements? In the form of dial indications on a dashboard. This limits the dispersion of data pilots have to contend with. That's why flight manuals have a limited number of pages and not infinite pages. Uh, and it picks out and highlights what is salient about the states of the sky outside the airplane. So in exactly the same way, what we call colloquially the physical world, the stuff we see, touch, feel, smell, uh, taste, these are all dashboard representations of the actual states of the external world. Now, they are very useful because you know, uh, the indications in the dials correlate with the states of the world. That's why pilots pay attention to their dashboard. And if we don't pay attention to the dashboard, we, we will die. We walk in front of a truck. Uh, same thing for the airplane. If the pilot doesn't pay attention to the dials, he'll crash the plane. And by the way, a pilot can fly without a transparent windscreen. A pilot can fly by, by instruments alone, only by looking at the dashboard. That's us. We are pilots in the flight of life who do not have a transparent window to see the world as it actually is. All we have is the dashboard that evolution has given us. We are born inside an airplane cockpit that has no windows, only has a dashboard. So naturally, we mistake the dashboard for the sky outside. We mistake the physical world for the real world um, outside. And it's in, for almost all practical applications, this is okay. It's a fair mistake to make. It, it, it's no problem. You still survive. But when it comes to the big questions of life and existence and foundations of physics and the neuroscience of consciousness, now we have to dig deeper and understand that although the dashboard is very useful and correlates with reality, it isn't reality in the same sense that the dashboard of an airplane isn't the sky outside, even though it conveys important information about the sky outside. So we are pilots, sorry, we are pilots that do not have these transparent windshields. All we have is here, so we mistake the dashboard for the world. And again, instrumentation doesn't change this. We still have to perceive the output of instrumentation. We still have to see uh, uh, the image formed through the lens system of a telescope. We still have to see the screen of an oscilloscope. We still have to perceive uh, uh, um, the, the output of instruments. So everything still gets filtered through the dashboard. And we are still completely constrained by the parameters of the dashboard, which we call physical parameters. Now, in foundations of physics, um, there are issues with the assumption that the physical world, instead of being a representation of the real world, is the real world. Because when we make this assumption, what we are saying is that the physical world, physical entities, have standalone existence, independent of measurement. Uh, but if the physical world is just a representation of the real world, then of course it's not independent of measurement. The dial indications in an airplane's dashboard are not independent of the measurements made by the airplane sensors because they convey and represent those measurements. Um, so a number of experiments in physics, and by the way, this series of experiments have earned the, the Nobel Prize in physics uh, last year, have shown that contrary to our vulgar assumptions, uh, physical entities, physical quantities, physical properties do not have standalone existence. We cannot speak of their existing prior to measurement. We can only speak of their existing upon measurement. 
Now, how is this concluded? Well, I, I, I'm going to summarize 45 years of complex experimentation in one little picture. So of course, this isn't rigorous. It's just to give you an intuition. Suppose you have a light source and you create two photons at the same time. So they are entangled. They are produced together, photon A and photon B. Suppose you transmit them through fiber optics for a little while, say a few kilometers. And then on one end, scientist Alice has a detector and makes a measurement on photon A. And scientist Bob on the other side, in an opposite direction, makes a measurement on photon B. For instance, um, uh, the angular momentum of a photon, the spin uh, along a certain direction. Now, as it turns out, what Alice chooses to measure about photon A, for instance, the particular direction uh, of spin, determines what Bob sees when, when Bob measures photon B at exactly the same time. In other words, it appears that photon B does not have whatever properties it has uh, prior to Alice choosing what, it's, what Alice is going to measure about photon A. Um, under physicalist assumptions, we would expect that Bob's measurement simply reveals what photon B already was prior to measurement. But if that were the case, there should be no correlation between what Bob sees and what Alice chooses, because regardless of what Alice chooses here, far away, photon B was already in flight, and it already is whatever it's supposed to be, regardless of Alice's choice. But that's not how it happens. Alice's choice correlates completely with what Bob sees when he measures photon B at exactly the same time. So photons A and B cannot be said to exist, in other words, to be determined by their properties prior to measurement, because as it, as it turns out, their properties are a outcome of measurement. So what is measured? Photons A and B are the outcome of measure, measurement. What is measured in the first place? Well, based on what we discussed, it's, it's very simple. Photons A and B are dial indications in the dashboard. So if, you, their, if their plane sensor doesn't measure anything, the dials indicate nothing. There are no photons A and B. But when the sensors do measure something now, as a result of that, uh, photons A and B appear on the dashboard. Photons A and B are not the thing measured. Photons A and B are the representation of the thing measured upon measurement a representation on dashboard. What is actually measured is then by definition, not a physical quantity, it's not physical. Because by definition, physicality is what appears on the dashboard, is what can be described through physical quantities like charge, mass, momentum, spin, geometrical relationships. Um, but the thing that is measured isn't physical. Because all these parameters, charge, mass, spin, spatial relationships, they are the parameters of the dashboard. They are the scales of the dials, not the, the states measured. The states measured um, are non-physical. Now, the, the only way to escape this, um, this conclusion from all these 45 years of results is to entertain one or another theoretical fantasy such as uh, Everettian uh, multiverses for which we have absolutely zero empirical evidence or the fantasy of uh, uh, global hidden variables which are, aren't even theoretically defined properly, uh, let alone evidence for it. So um, if we don't entertain these theoretical fantasies, we are forced um, to acknowledge that what is out there isn't physical. I'm not saying that it's spiritual. I'm not saying that it's uh, divine. Uh, it, no. It's states that cannot be exhaustively describable through physical quantities. It's very simple. They are external states. They are really out there. They can be measured. But what we call physicality is the result of measurement, is the representation of external states uh, in our internal cognitive dashboard. Now, another way to make sense of the correlations between uh, Alice and Bob's measurement, which are si simultaneous, and there is no way Alice can communicate to Bob or the detectors can communicate to one another. So how can they be correlated? It sounds like magic, right? How can Alice and Bob's results be so tightly correlated? 
Well, to understand this and, and understand that there is no magic, there is no voodoo involved, we just have to keep this in mind. Suppose that um, you are a soccer fan and there is a, a match going on in the stadium, but you can't be at the stadium. So what you do is you buy two television sets to watch the match at home. And you, each television is transmitting the, the match through a different broadcaster. So imagine that the different broadcasters have different cameras in the stadium. So the images in each TV set are different. They're not the same image because they are captured through different camera angles and so forth. But of course, they are entirely correlated because they are images of the same underlying reality. The screen is a representation of the underlying reality that is measured. And that's why the two images are correlated. Do the televisions need to talk to one another uh, in order for that correlation to be the case? Of course not. The TVs don't need to talk. Alice doesn't need to talk to Bob. Alice and Bob are looking at the same soccer match. And that's why their representations, photons A and B, are correlated without their needing to be communicating with one another. Um, the mistake we make would be similar to a time traveler from the 18th century who, who comes to your house and watches the match uh, on your couch along, uh, along with you. And our time traveler, he thinks that there are real little men and a real little ball inside each box. If you think that the television image is the thing in itself, is the real state of the world, that there are real little men inside the box, um, then, then you're flabbergasted. How do the little man on this box know how to run in perfect uh, uh, synchronicity with the little man on the other box without talking to one another? The box are separate. Whoa, magic, voodoo. <laughs> That's the error we make. Uh, we are like 18th century people looking at 21st century evidence. Um, we are still holding on to assumptions that come from the early enlightenment and which have no place anymore uh, in this day and age. If we part with those assumptions, suddenly magic and voodoo disappear and, and, and everything, seems to make, everything seems to make sense. I'm not saying that I solved the measurement problem here, but at least this is an avenue to think about it in a more coherent way. So what I'm proposing is the following. We are individual minds. How we become individual, I'll talk about it in a second. And we have internal cognitive states that we can represent as R. Now, there is an external world out there with states phi, represented by phi. Uh, and we interact with the world. We make a measurement through states S or sensory states. And we act upon the world when we move and perform an action through active states A. And if you look at how these things are represented here, you will see that what we call the physical world for being a representation mathematically, it's a Markov blanket. And then all the rationale, all, all, you know, all the, the luggage we have that has been developed around Markov blankets are now applicable. Markov blankets are representations, sensory representations and active states that translate between the states R and phi. And the mark of blanket is what we call the physical world, a representation of the world in itself, the real world, which is not physical, but is of course correlated with the physical world because that's what evolution uh, would have given us. Now, and now it's the important point here. The world as it is in itself is shared, of course, the states phi, uh, we are all immersed in the state spy. But the physical world is a personal representation of the state spy. So each one of us has a different physical world. Does it mean that all is relative, that uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we've deconstructed reality and said goodbye to reality? Of course not. Reality is bloody phi. And we know reality uh, through intermediation, by proxy, through the states S. And of course, because those states S of each individual are modulated by the states phi, they tend to be mutually consistent. You will describe my study in a way consistent with my own description of it if you were sitting here next to me. Both of our sets, S 
are modulated by the same set phi. Now this seems like, okay, what have I achieved here? I just replaced the physical world with something else. Well, that makes an enormous difference for how we think of ourselves, of reality, of the meaning of life. The whole shebang, AI, the whole thing changes. Um, but before we get there, um, I, I don't know whether we have enough time to go through some evidence. I think we have some time. Um, some of you might question uh, what I showed here by, by in, in the following uh, way. Our cognitive states are, are clearly correlated with our measurable brain states. You know, different experiences, subjective experiences, correlate with certain patterns of brain activity. Uh, so the suggestion is that, uh, okay, R is a product of physical states, S. If, if our internal cognit cognitive states, in fact, are, sorry, of physical, of physical states, phi, or external states, phi, uh, if our inner cognition uh, is a product of objective, non-mental states, then, then you're bound to doing this. And you will contradict this entire rationale. So do we have good reason to think that our experiences, in fact, are just brain states, objective, non-mental brain states? Because if we have reason to think that, then my story may not have legs. So do we? Ordinarily, of course, there are tight correlations between experience and, and, and patterns of brain activity. Um, that, however, can have multiple explanations, at least two. One is experiential states are caused by brain states. And the other is exper uh, brain states are merely the appearance, the representation on a dashboard of experiential states. And they would still correlate. But now, instead of being the cause of experiential states, brain states are the appearance. They are what experiential states look like when observed from the outside. I will specify all this more carefully in a moment. But even without going there, we can question whether there is always this tight correlation between experiential states and brain states. For instance, under psychedelics, which we always thought, you know, induce the, the mind-boggling psychedelic trance by lighting up the brain like a Christmas tree, psychedelics only reduce brain activity. There is a decrease in cerebro, cerebro blood flow all across the brain, and there is no increase uh, in cerebral, cerebral uh, blood flow. And this has been studied for a number of different psychedelics with a number of uh, neuroimaging techniques. For instance, this is fMRI and psilocybin, which is uh, the active ingredient of magic mushrooms. Uh, this is LSD, and the measurements are done via MEG instead of fMRI. But you can still see here that under LSD, uh, the power spectrum is consistently below uh, uh, the placebo baseline. Uh, except perhaps here, but this is well within the error margin. So it's consistent below for the entire, uh, 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 for, for, for all bands, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and so on and so forth. Psychedelics only reduce brain activity. And uh, I just flash many of, some of the many papers, um, studies done by different groups using different neuroimaging techniques, techniques different psychedelics, all leading to the same conclusions. Now, of course, uh, there is an attempt to sort of rescue physicalism, the notion that experiential states are caused by uh, uh, objective non-mental brain states, to rescue physicalism out of the clutches of this kind of results. And um, the most popular alternative so far is the so-called entropic brain hypothesis. And what people have seen is that if you study uh, uh, drug and placebo pairs, uh, the level of noise or random brain activity that doesn't fit into any discernible pattern uh, increases a tiny little bit for the drug compared to placebo. So if you have this scale of complexity here uh, um, at the top, one, um, it's, it's TV static, you know, purely random brain activity, uncompressible, and zero would be uh, only discernible patterns, no randomness at all. Um, then you see that uh, the drug increases a little bit the level of brain noise. But by how much? Well, by 0.005%. Uh, 
0 0.005 uh, uh, in a scale from 0 to 100. In other words, <laughs> it's to say that it's tiny is, is the overstatement of the century. And by the way, for some of the drug placebo pairs, the correlation went the other way around. Uh, uh, brain noise uh, decreased, and those people still had the unfathomable psychedelic uh, trance nonetheless. So uh, this uh, borders on the ludicrous, um, I think. Um, researchers defend this by saying it's statistically significant. Well, let's forget for a moment that statistical significance is an entirely arbitrary thing. P factor is entirely arbitrary. Uh, it, even if it is statistically significant, it only means that the effect observed is not an artifact of measurement or methodology, that it's a real effect. But it's a tiny real effect, and it's preposterous to, to try to account for the mind-boggling richness and intensity of the psychedelic trance based on a percent increase uh, in, of all things, unstructured brain, brain activity, brain noise. Um, but anyway, this is what is being attempted now. And it's not only psychedelics. Uh, people were studied, people with tumors uh, were studied for um, what uh, researchers called uh, uh, an index of self-transcendence. In other words, to what degree these people identify themselves not only with their body, but with something larger than themselves. And it turned out that uh, if you have patients score uh, uh, in a form uh, their level of self-transcendence before and after surgery for the removal of tumors in the brain, which always causes some collateral damage to surrounding tissue, um, self-transcendence increases after brain damage. Um, so, again, you have an impairment or a reduction of brain activity correlating with an experience of transcendence, like the psychedelic trance or like this, this way of identifying with something bigger than oneself. And that's not what one would expect under physicalist assumptions. Vietnam War era veterans were also studied for their propensity to having a religious experience which is also a kind of experience of self-transcendence. And people with damage to specific regions of their brain show a much higher propensity to this kind of religious experience. So again, enriched, intenser, broader experience correlating with a reduction or an impairment of regular brain activity, which is the opposite of what physicalism would expect. Um, trans mediums in Brazil, I, I reserve judgment about this medium ship stuff, but the result here is nonetheless interesting. They were studied uh, uh, under an fMRI, and they were asked to write down information on a piece of paper that allegedly comes from some transcendent source or whatever. And, um, and they divided two groups of mediums, what the researchers called less experienced mediums, which is their code for people who aren't really the thing. They, they, they just th say they are. This is the control. These are not mediums and what they called experienced mediums. Um, and what you see is that uh, in key areas of the brain associated with grammar, with linguistic work, with uh, rational thinking, um, for the controls, brain activity increased when these people were writing down this information from transcendent sources. It consistently increased. No surprise here, they needed to engage these areas of the brain in order to write text. But for the experienced ones, it only decreased. It consistently decreased. Did they write less complex text? No. The text was scored uh, automatically with an algorithm for a level of complexity, a measure of complexity. And in fact, the exp group wrote more complex text than the, than the controls. So I could go on and on. I mean, uh, um, syncope, when you pass out, when you hyperventilate, it's associated with transcendent experience as well. So what all of this uh, leads to is, is the following, and I, and I don't have slides for this, so I'll, go, I'll stop sharing and I'll go back to just talking to you. My hypothesis is the following. Out there, there is only a field of subjectivity, a field of mentation, mental stuff. We are dissociated aspects of that field. That's what life is. Life is what dissociation in this underlying field of mentation in nature looks like. It looks like metabolism. It looks like biology. 
in the same way that a patient with dissociative identity disorder, if you put that patient uh, under fMRI, and this has been done in the Netherlands in 2014 by Yolanda Schlumpf and, and her team, um, you get an, a pattern of measured brain activity um, that is identifiable as dissociated alters. Um, so there is something dissociation looks like even in the minds of people with dissociative identity disorder. So in this, for lack of a better expression, in this mind of nature that underlies reality, dissociation also looks like something, and it looks like us. It looks like biology, metabolism. And it is this dissociation that creates the division between the inside and the outside, creates the skin of the airplane, and leads to the emergence of a dashboard inside. So our internal dissociated cognitive states then represent external states because external states impinge on our dissociative boundary. And we've evolved to pick out on that impingement and represent the respective information to ourselves in the form of what we colloquially call the physical world, the stuff that appears on the screen of perception, the stuff we touch, taste, smell, see, hear. Um, and therefore, um, we are essentially mental beings. Um, our bodies are what our dissociated internal mental inner life looks like when it's observed from across a dissociative boundary. Physicality in general is what experiential processes look like when they are measured or observed from across at least one dissociative boundary. And that's why the world around us is physical, because we always observe the world around us through a dissociative boundary, our own dissociative boundary. And therefore, the states of the world upon measurement become represented within the dissociative boundary on our internal dashboard as physicality. And that's why when a brain scientist uh, cracks my head open and, and looks at me, he sees a brain or he sees brain activity because that brain activity too is a dashboard representation of my mental inner life when it's observed from across one or more dissociative boundaries. Our brain activity is what our inner conscious inner, uh, conscious life looks like from a perspective. It is not its cause. It is its appearance, its dashboard representation. And of course, death, the end of life, is the, the end of life is the end of the dissociation. And that's all there is to it. And if we see the world this way, even the psychedelic story I told you makes sense. Why do we experience, uh, we have much richer and intenser experience during a psychedelic trance, even though our brain activity reduces? Well, because what is being reduced is the dissociation itself. The brain activity that, that, that gets reduced is what the dissociative boundary itself, the dissociative process itself looks like. If you reduce or weaken that, um, the boundary becomes porous, permeable. And of course, you experience things from across the boundary because that's what reduced dissociation means. It means that there is more commerce uh, of information uh, across the boundary. And we call that a psychedelic trip. Um, and again, foundations of physics starts making sense as well because physicality is just representation. It's the result of measurement across a dissociative boundary. The thing itself, the thing in itself, the thing measured is not physical. It, what is it then? Well, it is mental. Mental states are not amenable to description through physical quantities. What is the length in yards of your thought? What is the weight in pounds of your emotion? What is the angular momentum of your fantasies? Now, th th these are natural states that we know exist because we have firsthand acquaintance with them. And we know that they are not physical in the sense of not being amenable to description through physical quantities. So it's obvious what the answer to the conundrum is. The world as it is in itself is also made of mental states, not my mental states, not your mental states, transpersonal, impersonal mental states out there, which impinge on our dissociative boundary. We, we pick up on that impingement and translate that. That impingement is a measurement. We pick up on it and translate that into an internal representation that in turn is physical and can be described in terms of physical quantities. Physical quantities are descriptions of what appears on the dials of our dashboard. The thing measured and represented on the dashboard um, is qualitative. 
it is experiential, it is mental. And I'll stop here. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much for that fascinating talk, Bernardo. Um, while the questions are trickling in, I'd like to take the opportunity to ask a couple of questions myself, actually. Uh, one being, uh, when you refer to reality being mental, what is the mind really? Does it have a substrate? Can it be mathematically studied? Is it another piece of equipment that we can use in order to study that uh, these other parameters that you were mentioning as R or psi or things like that, the underlying reality, right? Is it a common substrate between physical world and the mind or is something else going on? What exactly well, can we study and what can we not study? Can we study it? Can we model it? Can we predict it? Well, obviously, yes. Uh, we have been successful for the past 500 years, well, at least 400 in science. And what science does is to study the patterns and regularities of nature's behavior. And we have been very successful in modeling and predicting those. And that's why we can develop technology. We know what nature will do next. Um, and therefore, we, we can leverage that in our own favor. So, of course, the mind of nature is predictable. Um, re remember the following. We, we, when we talk about a mind out there, we tend to project anthropomorphically uh, the higher level mental functions that we evolved as animals fighting for survival in a planetary ecosystem. But mind at large, the mind out there didn't evolve in a planetary ecosystem. It didn't, it didn't have to react to environmental challenges. It didn't have to develop higher level mental functions such as reflection, introspection, self-awareness, um, all this stuff. Why would it have evolved that? It's, it's not fighting for survival in a planetary ecosystem. Only its dissociative outers are us. So we develop these higher level mental functions, but it stands to reason that the mental states out there beyond life are very simple and predictable. And that's why science is so successful in modeling them and technology is so su successful in leveraging our ability to predict what nature will do next. You could think of the mind of nature at large as a insti instinctive mind, a purely spontaneous, non-reflective, non-self-aware mind. Um, now, does, is that mind then something extra? Is it an extra metaphysical or ontological substrate that I'm postulating? No, what I'm saying is that that mind is what there is. And everything else is a representation thereof, a cognitive representation of ours. The physical world is our representation of this mind. And this mind is the only thing that is out there. It's not a layer underneath. It's the only thing that is out there. It's the physicality that, that is a sort of, it's not a metaphysical extra because physicality as a cognitive representation is itself mental as well, but it's in here, it's not out there. So everything is mental, but in the dance of mental processes in nature, some mental processes represent others. The mental processes we call the physical world, what appears on the screen of perception, represent the states of the mental processes beyond our dissociative boundaries. And that's all there is to it. There is only this mind. Everything else are patterns of excitation of this mind. You can think of it as an excitable multidimensional substrate, like in quantum field theory, where you have the 17 quantum fields, and, and we've been working now for four decades trying to unify that in, in one field, you know, grand unification theories. Now, pretend we succeed. My contention would be that that one quantum field left at, at the end, that's our theoretical model of a field of subjectivity. And that field of subjectivity is all there is in nature. We are dissociated segments of it. Uh, um, the, the phenomena of nature are our cognitive representations of the excitatory dynamics of this field. In exactly the same way that every electron, every photon, every muon, every gluon, every neutron, uh, are patterns of excitations of underlying quantum fields. In exactly the same way, all nature are patterns of excitation of one field of subjectivity. That, that, that's the contention. Interesting. Thank you. Another very quick question, because we have a few questions from the participants as well. So related to the theme of this colloquium series about consciousness reality, what exactly is 
consciousness in your picture? Is it part of the mind or mental phenomena? And as we've been dealing with in physics, does the conscious observer have any role to play in determining the outcome of everything that is there in the physical world? So I use the words mind and consciousness interchangeably, and I mean the same thing by them. What I mean by them is phenomenal consciousness, not meta-consciousness, not metacognition, not self-reflection, none of these higher level mental functions, pure phenomenal consciousness. And I, I use the word mind in that sense because in the Western tradition, we have tended to do that since Descartes and before him. Um, now, what is it? No. When we, ask, when we ask the question, what is it? We are asking for a reduction. We are asking for an explanation of something in terms of another. That's what we are asking when we ask, what is it? What's a body? Well, it's a set of uh, biological systems. What's a biological system? Well, it's something made of tissues. What is a tissue? Well, it's made of cells, cells made of molecules, those of atoms, those of elementary subatomic particles, and those of an underlying field. So. That's what we are asking. We are asking for a reduction. My contention is that at the very bottom, bottom of that chain of reduction, there is a field of phenomenal consciousness that is spatially unbound. Now, you cannot answer the question what it is because since it is at the end of the chain of reduction, it is what there is. You cannot explain anything in terms, you, you cannot explain it in terms of anything else. You cannot keep on explaining one thing in terms of another forever. Whatever your metaphysical beliefs, you cannot play that game forever. At, at one point, you hit rock bottom and you get to what philosophers call an ontological primitive, which is the thing that cannot be explained in terms of anything else. For me, phenomenal consciousness, a spatially unbound field of phenomenal consciousness, is that rock bottom level. Now, what we can do is explain everything else in terms of the dynamics of phenomenal consciousness. That is entirely possible, and I, I submit to you. So uh, analytic idealism is parsimonious in the sense that it puts only one element in 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 the in the in, in the reduct in, in the uh, reductive set. There is only one thing in terms of which we can explain everything else. But of course, that one thing we cannot say what it is. It is, it is what it is. Everything else are its patterns of excitation. But the thing that is excited, it's like asking what is a quantum field? No physicist can tell you what a quantum field is because it's defined in terms of its effects. Quantum field, a quantum field is that whose excitations are elementary subatomic particles. In exactly the same way, I, would, I could say, and I will say, phenomenal consciousness is that whose excitations are the entire dynamics of nature. Thank you. And I assume that it is possible to develop a mathematics for this underlying fundamental field. So we all await this uh, <laughs> grand theory at some point. Well, but uh, we have uh, some interesting questions by the participants. Uh, the first one is by Akande Didas. And he asks that, uh, first conjectures that uh, I'm I'm with you on uh, your key high, key thesis points of the nature of reality. Could you please clarify what you mean uh, that we are the dissociative aspect? So is this the cause of our sense of ourselves as a subjective experiencer? experiencer? How does that arise? And in the representation of the world, where do qualia reside? Qualia are the excitations of, of, of an underlying field of phenomenal consciousness. That's what qualia are. Different excitations lead to different qualia. Um, you, you could regard my, my talking about excitations as a model of qualia. There are immensely varied qualia, probably infinite, uh, an infinite number of qualia out there. Well, you can still reduce that to one field of consciousness because one field can have infinite different patterns of excitation. So playing this, this game of reducing complexity to, to ontological primitives this is what physics has been doing all along. So um, I, I'm not doing anything different. Qualia are just the different patterns of excitation of a field of subjectivity. Now our sense of pure I-ness 
which philosophy, in philosophy is called core subjectivity, um, I think that's inherent to the field. Core um, subjectivity is inherent to the field, but our sense of personal identity, of our sense of being a mental agent separate from the rest of nature, um, that is cultural. That is that's uh, um, a narrative. It's a story of self that we tell ourselves. In other words, it's a pattern of excitation of our dissociated minds. Now, what is dissociation? Um, dissociation is a process that we know empirically to exist by means of which one mind seemingly breaks up into separate disjoint centers of awareness. There was a very interesting study in 2015 done in Germany. Uh, a woman uh, claimed to have uh, suffered from dissociative identity disorder, severe one, and claimed to have two alters that were blind, even though the woman could, perfect, could see perfectly, there was nothing wrong with her. And her clinicians had the wonderful idea that to, to instrument her with an EEG cap to measure her brain activity when one of the alters that claimed to be blind was in control. And lo and behold, they couldn't measure any brain activity in her visual cortex, even though the woman's eyes were wide open. She really could not see. Uh, but as soon as the host personality would be back in executive control, normal brain activity would return to the visual cortex. Dissociation fragments mind seemingly in a way so strong that it literally makes you blind to what is right in front of your open, well-functioning eyes. Um, so it's no surprise that I can't read your thoughts and you can't read mine. If dissociation can make you blind to what's in front of your eyes, let alone to what's happening in China in the galaxy of Andromeda or in the mind of another person, you know, which is across two dissociative boundaries, not only one. Um, there, there was a study done in Harvard by Deidre Barrett uh, about 20 years ago. They had a wonderful idea. They started to start, decided to study the dreams of patients with severe dissociative identity disorder. Turns out that one quarter of those patients have dreams, and those dreams are experienced by different alters concurrently. Different alters of the patient partake in the same dream at the same time and report on the dream later from its own unique perspective within it. And the other alters are also perceived in the dream. One alter can see another. Actually, there is a, uh, one of the reports from one of the patients um, is such that five alters are taking part in a story. Not only can they see and talk to one another, one alter clubs another over the head. You can club an alter <laughs> over the head. And all of this is happening within the same mind. And you can transport that to one level in the hierarchy of nature up. And you get us, alters of a dissociated universal mind. And we can see and talk to one another and club each other over the head just like it happens in the mind of a patient with DID. Now, beyond that, we do not have a satisfying conceptual account of exactly how dissociation works. We know that it works. We have known that now for sure for 20 years since the advent of neuroimaging. Clinically, we have known it for centuries, but for sure for 20 years. Um, but we do not have a satisfactory conceptual account of exactly how it works, unfortunately. Thank you. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Uh, here's one from a special guest, actually, Edwin Bryant, uh, who says, you seem to be heading in a direction of certain non-dual systems in India. Is the phenomenal mentalism self-aware? And he goes on to say that I'm not sure that question, that question can be answered, can it? But we are self-aware. So what is this dissociative boundary that separates us? Is it too mental? Is it also mental? And what prevents an ontology of absolute mental monism with no forms or qualities? And what are the individuators or boundaries in your model? So a few things actually uh, here, if uh, you yeah. could please address this. So is the dissociative boundary mental? Of course. You can think of the dissociative boundary as inferential isolation. So in graph theory, you can think uh, of the dissociative boundary as what defines a segment of your graph that is not connected 
to anything beyond itself. It is internally connected, but uh, um, not connected to anything around it. That's how you can think of dissociation. In other words, dissociation is not an extra, it is the absence of cognitive associations. And when that absence is coherent enough that it isolates, um, um, inferentially isolates internal mental activity from mental activity surrounding it, then we talk of a boundary. But the boundary is not a thing, it's the absence of cognitive associations. Um, and, and therefore it's of course mental because all there is are cognitive associations. Um, is analytic idealism consistent with Eastern non-dualism? I've come to conclude that, that it is. I didn't come to it from meditation. I'm, 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 I'm spiritually, I'm terrible. I'm, I, I don't have a good mind um, for that stuff. I only have transcendent experiences with high dose psychedelics, which are legal in my country. So I experimented with that. But I come at it from pure reasoning and, and empirical evidence, but um, I feel reassured that it dovetails so well with people who arrive at the same conclusions through introspection. Because if all there is is one mind of nature, it stands to reason that introspect, introspection too is a valid path to knowledge about the whole and all, because there is only one mind um, in nature beyond the dissociation. Um, now, what I don't understand is talk of a monistic mental ontology without qualities. Um, I, I, because qualities are mental and mentation without qualities is only the potential for qualities. It's the field when it's not excited. It's like speaking of the quantum field when it's not excited at all, when there is no quantum foam or... Uh, well, we know that in nature, it doesn't work like that. Uh, quantum fields are always self-exciting. There is always a quantum foam. They are never at rest. Uh, I think mind is the same thing because I think mind is uh, the quantum fields. Uh, it's never completely at rest. It's always self-exciting. So there is no ontology of pure mentation without qualities. You would need to have only the potential for qualities and not the qualities themselves. You know, and you're not talking then about anything that is measurable. Um, now, self-awareness uh, is mind inherently aware of itself. It depends on what we mean by the word, but by, by the expression self-awareness. Um, I have a friend, Rupert Spira, who is uh, a spiritual teacher, and he he talks about consciousness being inherently knowing itself. It's in the very nature of consciousness to know itself. What he means by that is that consciousness knows itself by direct acquaintance. By being itself, since it's consciousness, there is a sense in which it, whatever it's conscious of, it is itself because it's the only thing that there is. But there is another technical sense for the expression self-awareness, which uh, entails what psychologists call re-representation. And that's something else, that, that's metacognition. That's when you take a step away from your own mental consciousness and you re-represent your own mental activity to yourself in order to evaluate uh, or inspect the contents of your own mind. Now, the latter is a high level mental function. The latter is conscious metacognition. I don't think it's inherent to mind. I think it's something that has evolved over 4 billion years on planet Earth at the cost of a lot of blood and suffering. Um, it was not there from the beginning. Um, I don't think nature is self-reflective or metacognitive or it's, it has premeditated this whole thing. I think nature is spontaneous. I'm a naturalist. And therefore, self-awareness, technically speaking, entailing re-representation or metacognition, I don't think it's inherent at all. We evolved that at great cost over the millennia. Yeah, there are, uh, I just like to uh, maybe bring out uh, two very quick questions. Okay. There are plenty of questions which we might get into later after the colloquium, but uh, I particularly like these two ones. One, the first one is how would you classify artificial intelligence? Would uh, it ever have mental states? And the second question is what experiments? would you suggest to demonstrate mind as a quantum field? Okay, the first question first. Um, everything is mental states. 
So a computer is also made of mental states, transpersonal mental states, which appear to us as silicon chips and copper and wires and chips and all that. Um, but when we ask about sentient AI, conscious AI, we are not asking just whether it's made of mental states. We are asking something more. What we are asking is, does it have private conscious inner life analogously to how I have private conscious inner life bound by the boundaries of my body? Can uh, an AI also have private conscious inner life of its own bound by the boundaries of the computer? And my answer to that is no, we have absolutely no reason to think that. Because what you're asking is, is an intelligent computer also what an alter of universal consciousness looks like? That's what you're asking. When you ask, does it have private conscious inner life of its own? What you're asking is, is this also the appearance of a dissociative process in the mind of nature? And I think we have no reason to think that any more than we have reason to think that a thermostat or an abacus uh, has private conscious inner life of its own. Computer engineers know what is happening in that black box of a CPU or a GPU. The computer scientists may not know, and therefore they think that some kind of magic happens there, and therefore it might as well be conscious. But there are people on this planet who have built that stuff, and we know exactly what's going on there. And I can assure you that it doesn't matter how modern the GPU or the CPU, whatever it is doing, can in principle be done with PVC pipes, water, and pressure valves. You can build the most advanced CPU in the universe with PVC pipes, water, and pressure valves. It would be the size of a planet, maybe a star, but it is in principle possible. Now, a system of PVC pipes, water, and pressure valves is known to you. That's your house's sanitation system. It's your home sanitation system. Do you think it has a private conscious inner life of its own? If you don't, then you have, you have to ask yourself, will my opinion change if I keep adding more pipes and more pressure valves and more liters of water to it? Of course not. Adding more of the same stuff doesn't lead to the magical step from uh, uh, not being a dissociative segment of the mind of nature to being a dissociative segment with a mental inner life of its own. I think we will be able to create artificially uh, beings with private conscious in their life, but they will not look like computers. They will look like uh, biology. I think sentient AI, the challenge to do that is the same challenge as abiogenesis, the creation of life from non-life. Because nature is telling us that what dissociation looks like is metabolism, it's biology, not silicon uh, substrates and dielectrics and metals. That's not what it looks like. It's arbitrary to think that that too would be what a dissociated outer looks like. So I, I think sentient AI is just nonsense. It's something peddled by people who do not understand computers. They are power users of computers, but they do not understand computers. Uh, we're running out of time, but the other small question, seemingly small question was, what experiments would you suggest uh, to demonstrate mind as a quantum field? So making this a testable right hypothesis, of course, it sounds like a very exciting hypothesis, but can we really test it out as the real question and develop a mathematics and theory for it? Well, there are a great number of things that, can, that you could imagine as a good test for this hypothesis. And by the way, they have been tested. Um, you see, idealism is a notion that uh, the only type of state that there is in nature is a mental state. Now, mental states are the only given of nature. They are pre-theoretical. We have mental states before we start theorizing about mental states or non-mental states. Uh, it's what we have when we start thinking. It's mental states. So mental states absolutely exist. And you can have debate about whether they are reducible or not, whether you need something that is non-mental or not, whether it makes sense to talk of the non-mental. But mental states exist. They are pre-theoretical. They are the soul given of nature. Now, what we then have to test is, do we need more the mental states to make sense of nature? I would argue, no. All we need is external mental states to account for the world we inhabit. We don't need to make them non-mental. So the burden of proof 
belong, uh, it rests with those who postulate the extra ontological type called the non-mental purely quantitative states. If you don't need that, then it's like the flying spaghetti monster. I, I cannot refute the hypothesis, but we don't need the hypothesis. Now, if you open that gate and then all kinds of not disprovable nonsensical stuff, um, we'll get people asking you, well, what experiment can you propose to disprove the flying spaghetti monster? Well, I can't, I can't disprove it. But my question is, do we need that? No, we don't. In exactly the same way, we don't need non-mental states. We only need external mental states the internal and the external being defined by a mental process we know to exist, and that is dissociation. We know empirically it exists. Now, what are these experiments then? What can they, sh can, can they show us? Well, let's look at the alternative hypothesis. Under physicalism, the real states of nature are non-mental, and therefore no mental stuff should have standalone reality. And therefore measurements should only disclose their properties, not create their properties. Can we come up with experiments that check this? Yes, and we have been running those experiments for 45 years and they have won the Nobel Prize last year. And the result is no, no uh, uh, non-mental states or physical states do not have standalone existence unless you entertain science fiction for which we have absolutely no empirical evidence. Short of that, no, no uh, uh, physical states do not have standalone reality. That's 45 years of experimentation for you. Another experiment you can devise. Um, if, if physical brain states are the cause of mental states, then there can be nothing to mental states that can't be traced back to, 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 to physical states. If physical states cause mental states, then everything about mental states has to be traceable back to physical states, yeah? Now, if physical states in, instead are what mental states look like when observed from across a dissociative boundary, now you don't have that constraint anymore because the appearance of a phenomenon does not need to convey all there is to know about the phenomenon. I'm seeing your face right now. That's your appearance represented on my computer screen. But I, I, I can't see your lungs. I can't see your back. I can't see your blood flow. Your appearance correlates with your mental inner life. If you get very sad, I will see you crying. But the appearance doesn't convey everything there is to know about the thing it's an appearance of. So if under certain non-ordinary circumstances, there are things about felt experience that cannot be traced back to patterns of brain activity, then you have your answer. Brain activity is now the image of experience and therefore it doesn't need to be complete. But if brain activity is the cause, then there can be nothing to experience that you can't find back in, 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 in patterns of brain activity. The results are out. Psychedelic research, uh, uh, trans, uh, neuroimaging of trans states, um, uh, um, studies of uh, brain damage, um, acquired savant syndrome. All these things show us that there are a great many number of non-ordinary circumstances in which that appearance is indeed incomplete. You cannot find stuff about our mental inner life uh, back in patterns of brain activity. And that shows you that the correlation between the two is the cor correlation between the thing in itself and an appearance as opposed to a cause and an effect. Those experiments have been done as well. Thank you again, Bernardo. Uh, so this concludes the Consciousness and Reality Colloquia for the current academic year. And stay tuned for more in the next academic year. Um, with this, I'd like to thank again our speaker, Bernardo Kastrup, uh, for his excellent presentation and uh, very nice engagement with the questions and answers. I'm not sure we resolved all of them satisfactorily, but uh, hopefully we can have you back at some point in the near future. And I'd like to thank all the participants and everyone who made this event happen. Please have a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Take care.